Our scripture reading this day is from one of Paul's letters to the Christians in Corinth. Paul sometimes rambles around a lot as he is trying for us to reach for the truth, to articulate the truth of what our Christian life means, what faith in Christ means. Sometimes it's really hard to understand what he's saying. He has kept biblical scholars working for generations. He's given them great job security for centuries. But then there are times when Paul speaks, when he writes, and what he says is so powerful that we want to hold on to it, hold it in our hearts, hold it in our minds. And this, these few verses of, from Paul are among those particular words. From Paul's second letter to the Corinthians, verses 5 through 12 of chapter 4. I invite you to listen for God's living word. For we do not proclaim ourselves. We proclaim Jesus Christ as Lord and ourselves as your servants for Jesus' sake. For it is the God who said, let light shine out of darkness who has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. But we have this treasure in clay jars, so that it may be made clear that this extraordinary power belongs to God and does not come from us. We are afflicted in every way, but not crushed, perplexed, but not driven to despair, persecuted, but not forsaken, struck down, but not destroyed, always carrying in the body the death of Jesus so that the life of Jesus may also be made visible in our bodies. For while we live, we are always being given up to death for Jesus' sake so that the life of Jesus may be made visible in our mortal flesh. So death is at work in us, but life in you. Thanks be to God. Holy wisdom, holy words. Let us pray. Living God, by the light of your Holy Spirit, Open our eyes to see the light of this new day. Open our lips to tell of the empty tomb. Open our hearts to receive the good news. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Andy Goldsworthy is a sculptor from Scotland. He's known for taking natural objects sticks and stones, moss and leaves, and arranging them into incredibly beautiful and quite often absolutely temporary works of art. Not long ago, I saw a documentary about his work and I was completely captivated. The film begins with Goldsworthy traveling to the shore where he proceeds to take pieces of driftwood, hundreds and hundreds of pieces, which he then stacks and overlaps to create a massive structure. He sets it directly in the path of the incoming tide. When the water comes in, it envelops and fills the sculpture and then gradually dismantles it. The image on the front of your bulletin is a photograph of another one of his works of art. It's a domed room in Rio de Janeiro made entirely of clay and sticks. It's an enormous vessel, a clay jar, but big enough for you to step right into. You can see that it's cracking. It's in a state of suspended collapse, Goldsworthy says. And the movement, the change, the disintegration of the clay is part of the art. My favorite sculpture in the film I saw was an intricate knitting of dried stalks fastened at angles with thorns. The whole thing 
hung somehow invisibly from a high tree branch. When a breeze came along, the weaving swayed, and I was amazed that this fragile piece could withhold the force. It held together until a stiffer wave came along a moment later, and then the whole thing gave way. I was completely taken in by the way in one moment it seemed to defy gravity, and how in the next all of it fell to the ground in pieces. It made me wince to see such beauty and such effort disappear in an instant, just like that. In watching it, you can't help but be struck by how such common elements things around us all the time, things we pass by in the world, usually without paying much attention, rocks and dirt, branches and leaves, water and ice, are ready to astonish us if we will pause long enough to look at them with fresh eyes. But more than that, it dawns on you how all of Goldsworthy's work speaks a truth about existence. His art imitates the paradox of life, its durability and its transience, its resilience and its fragility, its everyday plainness and its ineffable edges. The documentary ends with sparkling silver shapes flying up and filling the air only to fall and disappear seconds later. I could not figure out what I was looking at until the camera zoomed out to show that it was Andy, his arms full of snow. He threw all of it high into the air. It shimmered, and then it vanished. It was so simple, and yet, at the same time, so breathtaking. I was completely surprised. As the snow was transfigured, it made me think of all the mystical moments that show up in Scripture. When Jesus is baptized, the sky opens up and a dove descends, and God tells those gathered that this is God's beloved child. Later, when Jesus climbs a misty mountain, God's voice speaks of that belovedness again until Jesus practically shimmers with it. The disciples who are with him want this vision to last forever. The light leaking from Jesus is so bright that even Moses and Elijah, dead men from the other side of heaven's door, show up to take in the view. Indeed, the Bible is full of such moments when the door cracks open between this world and a wider reality. Moses meets God in a burning bush. Jacob finds a ladder full of angels. Job hears God's voice out of the whirlwind. There's also an element of otherworldliness drawing near in every gospel account of the resurrection. The disciples, you may remember, are locked away in an upper room, hiding in fear and confusion when the risen Christ enters somehow. He breathes on them, and through that breath, they find peace. Other followers recognize him on the road to Emmaus when a stranger lifts a loaf of bread, blesses it, breaks it, shares it. Suddenly, they see him risen. But just as suddenly, Jesus disappears again. And then they remember how their hearts were burning as they traveled, and they understand that he had been with them all along. Mary Magdalene stands weeping beside the empty tomb. There are angels there, but she is not impressed. She is too heartbroken. And even when the risen Christ is right in front of her, she mistakes him as the gardener. It's a strange detail, but apt perhaps because given 
that in this encounter, it seems that some new creation is rising up in their midst. When he calls her by name, she finally recognizes who is right there beside her. He's there. But when she reaches out to touch him, he says she can't hold on. She may want to stay here forever, but as soon as she has seen him, he sends her out to tell the news to the others. In each encounter with the risen Christ, there is a flash of clarity, a glimpse of another world, of a life that can't be killed and a love that never dies. We see this love, the Apostle Paul says, through a mirror dimly. But when the complete comes, we will see it face to face. The way scripture describes such occasions may not be the language that we would use. And it's too bad, really, that we don't talk more often about such things in our own lives. But it's true, I believe, that we all experience moments when heaven peeks through to earth, when the veil is lifted and when grace steps in, or beauty takes over, or love pours out and overwhelms us with its power. We might dismiss them because such luminous encounters are often fleeting, lasting only for an instant. But if we pay attention, we may also discover that they are enough to sustain us. They are enough because the greater truth Paul reminds us is this. We may be afflicted in every way, but we are not crushed, perplexed but not driven to despair, persecuted but not forsaken, struck down but not destroyed. And this treasure we have, this treasure we are, each one of us, it comes in an earthen vessel, a clay jar, imperfect as life so often is, cracked and flawed as all of us are. But this treasure shines none the less because God our Creator, the one who said, let light shine out of darkness, is the same God who shone in the face of Jesus Christ and who shines in our hearts now. And this light, it can't be put out because its extraordinary power belongs to God. It does not come from us, but it shows up in our lives every now and then to remind us that even when human mayhem or personal sorrow, sorrow knocks the hope out of us, we can trust that still there is something larger and more enduring at work. Six years ago, on Valentine's Day, one of my dearest friends died. Some of you have heard me speak of Susan before. We were friends for most of my adult life. She was also one of my closest colleagues in ministry. We worked together side by side for many years. A year after she died, on the weekend between the anniversary of her death and her birthday, I invited several of our mutual friends to have dinner at her favorite restaurant. We were so glad to be together to remember and to celebrate her. We were also so engaged in our conversation that it was a while before we realized that it was taking a very long time for our food to arrive. More than an hour had gone by since we'd placed our order. Our server went back to the kitchen to check. The manager of the restaurant came out to apologize. He explained that our order had been misplaced and our meals were only now being prepared. When the food finally arrived, we looked up from our table to see the manager leading a procession of servers from the kitchen to our table. Suddenly, it felt like church. It felt like communion. After our plates were set in front of us, the manager then announced to us that there would be no charge for dinner. 
we were surprised. And then we started to laugh because somehow by God's ingenuity, it suddenly seemed plausible to all of us that our dear deceased friend had orchestrated this whole thing that Susan was the one who had misplaced our meal ticket so that we would linger together longer. Or that she had just taken out her American Express card and picked up everyone's tab. Or that she had just pulled this young manager aside and in her gently persuasive way explained to him the meaning of extravagant hospitality. That if he did this right, he'd have loyal customers for life. The server would end up receiving a very large tip, and he, the manager, would end up as a story told in a sermon on some Sunday morning. <laughs> I remember feeling an overwhelming urge that evening to get up from the table and to go to the kitchen to see if Susan was lurking back there with the wait staff and the cooks. Of course, she wasn't. And of course, she was. She was with us in our communion meal, in our laughter, in our love for her and hers for us, in all the ways she had changed each of us for good, in the larger life we were blessed to share with one another, and in the life which is now hers forever in God's eternal care. And that evening, as I looked around at the table, at our friends' faces shimmering in the candlelight, it also dawned on me how this group had been transfigured. Months earlier, these very same people were suffering, stricken with grief. Susan's rapid decline and her death had left all of us stunned and raw. We had to meet at least three times to plan her memorial service because we were incapable of making any clear decisions for a while and because we couldn't stop weeping whenever we were together. But on this night, a year later, the joy had risen and we were delighted. Our beloved friend was no longer with us but for a moment, by God's grace, the door between this world and the next opened, and we caught sight of her. Athanasius, an early Christian theologian, put it this way for us. More often than not, our experience of God is like walking into a room the moment after God has just stepped out. We get the glimmer, the sense, the scent, the aura, but not the presence. It's such an important theological insight, so helpful, I think, that it bears repeating. More often than not, our experience of God is like walking into a room the moment after God has just stepped out. We get the glimmer, the sense, the scent, the aura, but not the presence, not the fullness of God's presence anyway, not a presence that we can fully comprehend or hold on to or control. God's love transcends this world, and yet, and yet, the world is also so immersed in that love that at any moment, if we are ready for it, open to it. God may show us a glimmer, give us a sense or a scent, or surround us with an aura that catches us, surprises us in a way that reminds us of how good life is, how good God is, how good it is to share this life with others, and how love lasts and lasts and lasts. God's light God's light shines and cannot be put out. God's life rises up in us. We are given that as a gift forever. To continue our lives, to sustain us, and to share with others. Amen.